So um, in some ways, the, the key skill in being able to make progress on reading and interpreting formal mathematics is being able to take sentences which are written in English and convert them into formal logic. Maybe you don't actually have to write down the formal logic, uh, although we're going to do some of that, but you have to be able to interpret the underlying formal logic of the statements. And similarly, uh, you have to figure out how to express an idea that's given in formal logic in English that people normally speak and understand. Um, so let's look at a few examples, which I've taken from section nine of chapter two of this process of moving back and forth between formal logic and English language. So the first example that I want to look at is taken straight from the book. And um, this is a statement of the mean value theorem from calculus. Um, and you may have seen a discussion of this. If you took a rigorous calculus course, you may have even seen a proof. I just want to treat this from the point of view of, of a decoding problem and look at this statement uh, and see if we can figure out how it looks from the point of view of formal logic. So um, the relevant part is this business here. And it's an if-then statement. And it says f is a function from the real numbers to the real numbers, which has two properties. It's continuous on the interval, the closed interval from a to b, and it's differentiable on the open interval from a to b. Now, even if you don't know what these words mean, I mean, even if this were just f from r to r is flibber to gibbet on blog and jabberwocky on through, you can still uh, see what the logical structure is here because the hypothesis is that, first of all, f is a function from the real numbers to the real numbers. Second of all, f has this continuous property on the closed interval from A to B. And third of all, F is differentiable. And again, it almost doesn't matter what these words mean. The structure of the language tells you that you have these properties on the left-hand side of your if statement. And then on the right-hand side, you have a conclusion which begins with a, there is a number C and A, B. That's an existential quantifier. There exists C in the interval from A to B for which this expression holds. So um, this is a statement about every function from the real numbers to the real numbers. Remember that um, we had talked about this convention where you have an if-then statement and there's an implicit for all. So what is the implicit for all here? The implicit for all is that we're considering all functions from the real numbers to the real numbers such that let's call this statement here um, big C of F, meaning it's continuous on the interval from A to B. And this statement here, big D of F, meaning it's differential, differentiable on the open interval from A to B. I could put A and B into the notation too. but And what we're saying is if C of F is true and D of F is true about F, that implies that there exists C, so that C is in the open interval from A to B, and F prime of C is F of B minus F of A over B minus A. So when is such a statement true? Well, if you have a function from the real numbers to the real numbers, and it is either not continuous on the interval from A to B, or not differentiable on the open interval from A to B, 
then this entire statement is true. So the only place there's some work to be done is if you have a function from the real numbers to the real numbers, which has these two properties. It is continuous and it is differentiable on these respective intervals. And in those cases, if f satisfies those two conditions, then you have some work to do. You have to show that there exists a C, which satisfies the condition that it's between A and B, and for which this condition on the derivative at that point holds. So in this situation, you would be able to assume that C of F and D of F are, tr are true, because if they're not, there's nothing more to check. You would be able to assume that both of them are true. Having assumed that both of them are true, you would then have to somehow find this C. Let's look at a couple more examples. This is mentioned in the book as well. It's example 2.9. This is called Goldbach's conjecture. And it says that every integer greater con a conjecture is something which people believe to be true, but which they're unable to prove either way. So every even integer greater than two is the sum of two primes. So for example, th let's see, th uh, let's look at four. Well, four is two plus two. Six is three plus three. You're allowed to use the same prime twice. Eight is five plus three. Eleven is seven. No, it's not seven plus four. It's um, Oh, it's not even. Sorry. Had a moment of panic there. But you understand. I'll leave it in the video so you can enjoy this. Uh, 12 is even. So 12 is supposed to be the sum of two primes. So I think it's 7 plus 5. And so on. And Goldbach conjectured, meaning he guessed, based on this evidence, that this is always true. I think everybody believes this, but it's still not known uh, for certain. So if we want to look at this in, in, in a logical form, it begins with the word every. So every is a universal quantifier. It's a for all statement. So this is saying something. It's saying for all x, which is an integer, and even, and greater than 2, so those are the conditions. It has to be an integer, and it has to be even, and it has to be greater than 2. So those are the, the relevant statements are x is even. That's an open sentence. x is bigger than 2. That's an open sentence. We've put them together to make x even and x bigger than 2. That's an open sentence. And then we've put a universal quantifier for all x in z in front so that now it's a statement at least and it's supposed to under these hypotheses supposed to imply that x that there exists two primes in the set of prime numbers such that x equals p plus q and we could, uh, if we were being careful here, we should really write this as there exist P and there exist Q. There, let's, let me fix it up. There exists P and P. That's the first prime number. And there exists Q and P. That's the second prime number where X equals P plus Q. So um, here P is the set of prime numbers. So again, we're in a situation where we have a, an implication where we have a, a universal quantifier over the whole implication. And if these two conditions are true, then we need to find something that exists, P and Q. So we don't know what P and Q are. And in fact, as I said, that this is still an open question. There are other ways of doing uh, of writing this. The book gives a uh, gives slightly different approach. If, so you should probably look at that. But of course, since you're reading the textbook, I don't have to say that. 
And now I want to look at two problems that I've taken out of the uh, out of the text. Just they're both solved in the back of the book, but I wanted to discuss the solution a little bit. So the first the first statement is if x is prime, then the square root of x is not rational. So the um, the answer given in the back of the book is that you you make the statement you let p of x be the statement x is prime. And you let q of x be the statement um, x is a in q. It's a rational number. Square root of x is a rational number. And then you think about the statement. You write it as for all x, x prime. P of x implies not q of x. In other words, if once you know that x is prime, if p of x is true, meaning x is a prime number, then square root of x must not be a rational number. And of course, if x is not a prime number, this is automatically true. So the question is, is this always true? Always true. The only comment I wanted to make about this is this statement here, square root of x is a rational number. How do you express that in logical terms? What does it mean to say that square root of x, what does it mean to say that, let's make the statement, look at this statement more closely. Q of x means x is a rational, square root of x is a rational number. This is actually an existence statement because, um, what does it mean to be a rational number? It means that um, that the square root of x belongs to the set of rational numbers. But what does it mean to be the square root of x? It means that, y, that the square root of x squared equals x. So the formal way to say that the square root of x is a rational number would be to say that, uh, so square root of x rational can be written in the following way. There exists a y in the rational numbers such that y squared equals x. So in other words, we're saying that you can, if you can solve the equation y squared equals x with y in the rational numbers, then the square root of x is a rational number. And if you think back to the examples where we did, where the question of the truth or falsehood depends a lot on the set Q, on the set that you put here, this is a case where if you replaced Q by R, it would be true for any, I mean, any positive integer, primes are positive, uh, they're gonna have a, a square root in the, in the real numbers, but not in the rational numbers. So I think maybe a better way to write this would be for all X in Z, if x is prime, I don't need the if, x is prime implies there does not exist, so not there exists y such that y squared equals x. And here I need to be careful, y is in q. And we talked a little bit about negating their exist statements. So we could even write this a little bit differently. X is prime implies for all Y in Q, Y squared is not equal to X. And here what we're saying is if you have a prime number, and you take any rational number you want and square it, you're never gonna get x. And that's yet another way of saying that the square root of x is not a rational number. One more example, maybe just for fun. So uh, problem 2.13 asks you to look at the statement, everything is funny as long as it is happening to someone else, and asks you to put this into logical form. And the suggestion that the book gives in the answers is, to make m of x be the statement, x is happening to me. Let's not take this too seriously, but x is happening to me. S of x is x is happening to someone. And f of x is that x is funny. 
And so they say for all x, not m of x and s of x. So this, this is going to be true if whatever x is, it's happening to someone and not happening to me. If those are true, then that means that x is funny. So if you read what this is saying here, it's saying it's written in a funny way because it doesn't look like an if then statement. But what it really is saying is if something's happening to someone else, it's funny. But if it's happening to me, it's not funny. So um, that's what this says. If something is ha if, if something's happening to someone else, but not me, then it's funny. So this is an example how of where you have an, impl an implication, but it's because of the way the English language works. It's not as obvious as it should maybe be to make your life easier. Um, it's this as long as construction, which I think is, is kind of a version of it.